Hello and welcome to the Wolf SSL live webinar, Wolf SSL and Infineon Technologies, bringing TPM to the embedded MCU market. Presented by Wolf SSL Senior Software Engineer David Korski, Infineon Technology Marketing Director Joseph Kohn, and Application Engineer Paul Kissinger. My name is Shizuka and I'll be moderating the webinar. All attendees will be in listening only mode. If you have a question, please use the Q&A box. We will host a Q&A session following the presentation. The webinar will also be recorded and made available on our YouTube channel shortly after the presentation. If you'd like to stay updated with all the latest from Wolf SSL and Infineon Technologies, follow us on X, connected with us on LinkedIn, and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Also, feel free to email us at fax at wolfssl.com if you have any additional questions. And now I would like to give a brief company overview before we move to the technical presentation. Today, Wolf SSL secure over 2.5 billion connections. We have more than 2,500 2, OEM customers, and that's a number of sellers. Wolf SSL consists of over 50 dedicated employees, most of which are engineers. This progress is, of course, supported by a strong partner network that we are proud of. Since the beginning, our engineering team has developed several embedded security products, including WolfCrypt with DO170A support, FIPS certification and a FIPS ready offering, MQTT up to the V5 specification, SSHB2, TPM 2.0, a secure blue loader known as WolfBoot, Java, Java wrapper, and JSSC support, commercial support for Coral, and our latest products offering, Wolf HSM. These offerings are accompanied by strong maintenance and support plan up to the 24-7 level. We also offer full service consulting. And now I'd like to turn it over to David, Joseph, and Paul to talk about bringing TPMs to the embedded MCU market. Thank you, Shizuka. Welcome to this joint webinar presented together with Wolf SSL and Infineon. Today we're going to talk about bringing TPMs to the embedded microcontroller market. My name is David Garski and I'm a senior software engineer with Wolf SSL. Been with the company over nine years and I'm the author of the Wolf TPM library. You'll find Wolf SSL in many different industry verticals, including medical devices, automotive, industrial, IoT, appliance, routers, sensors, pretty much you name it. We secure the internet by securing data. Wolf SSL was founded in 2004 when MySQL needed a clean room implementation of SSL at that time, now TLS. Originally it was written in C++ and then in 2006 our co-founder Todd wrote it in C. This is the version that has progressed through the years and is known today as Wolf SSL and WolfCrypt. We have a large, <laughs> large portfolio of products as you can see. Um, all of these are really centered around the cryptography engine WolfCrypt. And it's been through FIPS 140-3 and the safety critical certification DO 178 at the DAL A level. Most of it has, including asynchronous cryptography, non-blocking cryptography, <laughs> a bunch of things. Um, our libraries, they're portable, configurable, lightweight. We provide a very consistent API uh, compatibility between the releases. Um, all of our libraries are production ready. The best We provide the best support that you'll find in the industry and the highest level of testing. Today, we're going to focus on Wolf TPM. If you're interested in any of these other products, we have webinars and videos on YouTube that you can find for these. So we are an open source software company. And what that means is that all of our code in its entirety is available either on GitHub or on our website from the download page. We license it as GPL or commercial. What that means is you can evaluate it with GPL. If you can't tolerate GPL, then you can purchase a commercial license. You can get professional support directly from the engineers. Um, also, we provide consulting services for integration or addition of new features. So now I'm going to hand it off to Joseph Cohn to talk about Infineon products. Thank you, David, and thanks for having us here today. Good morning, good afternoon, or even good evening to our audience here. 
My name is Joseph Cohn and I am responsible for our business with Trusted Platform Modules in the Americas region. Uh, I am with TPM actually since uh, almost about 20 years in different roles. With me today is Paul Kissinger, who is a real TPM maker, a very technical guy in our TPM team and some may even know him as he is the guy behind Let's Trust. Paul is joining us from Germany and he will take over the second half of our short presentation before we then hand back to David. What we will cover today is some of the basics about what and why TPM and why firmware updates are particularly important and we're making this webinar mostly about it. And then I'll share some of the key characteristics about our current TPM family and Paul eventually will be talking about uh, some technical and practical aspects, how we are enabling the MCU device segment to adopt TPMs. On one slide, very quickly, the wider context. Uh, Paul and I are in Infineon's Connected Secure Systems division, where we offer everything from MCUs like our PSOC and XMC family, Wi-Fi and Bluetooth connectivity with our AROC products. And certainly we offer development tools and software for these products, which are largely coming with the modest toolbox. Security is part of all of these products, but with our Optiga embedded security product family, our customers can simplify or enhance or even enable new security use cases. All of the products from our division here are really foundational to many embedded applications. And you can see several examples on the left side of the slide. So I think it's not just an empty phrase when I say, or when we say we're connecting the real world and real world devices with the digital world. Uh, this here is the portfolio of our connected secure systems division, but Infineon's other divisions further expand our offerings with semiconductors for power, sensors and other active and passive components. For the day though, the focus is on one of the core and most versatile security products in this portfolio, the trusted platform module, the Optiga TPM 2.0. A TPM is not a proprietary and not an Infineon invented product. The TPM is a standardized hardware root of trust and the Trusted Computing Group, or short just TCG, is the standardization organization for the TPM. And the TCG this year celebrates their 25th anniversary and we Infineon have shipped our first TPM back in 2003. Now with so much history and hundreds of millions of TPM in the field, I won't go through all the glory details of what is a TPM and what can you do with it. That would be quite time consuming and definitely too much. Uh, and there are many openly available trainings and educational resources available. The use cases on this slide represent just a selection of the most common ones and the most pertinent ones to embedded device applications. If you want to go deeper into these, I recommend to visit the trustedcomputinggroup.org on their website. They have plenty of resources there. Or leave us a feedback after the webinar and the Wolf SSL or the Infineon team will make time for a call and discuss things in the necessary detail. You may probably already know the Infineon's SLB 9670 which has been a very successful generation of TPM that we had introduced in 2015. And back then it was the first discrete TPM 2.0 in the market. The TPM's functionality and properties are largely standardized. After all, it's not just a TCG, but a recognized ISO standard. Uh, it's ISO IEC 11889. And the TPM 2.0 standard has not dramatically changed since then. But still security and also functional requirements are evolving over time. And so in 2022, we have introduced the successor of the 9670 and the next generation of our TPMs, the Optiga SLB 9672 with the SPI interface and the 9673 with the I2C interface. And these are our current TPM products. Many of the properties on this slide here reflect must have requirements to comply with the TPM standard and the specification. However, among the things that are unique and special uh, is that the 9672 was the first TPM in the market with a step towards PQC readiness. What does it mean and why is it important? Every TPM has a firmware update mechanism, must have a firmware update mechanism. 
and this is, has actually been securely evaluated and certified. On this TPM, or on these two TPMs, we have further secured the firmware update process with an additional and PQC approved XMSS signature scheme. And this is actually quite important because TPMs have life cycles of easily more than 10 or even 15 years in the field. And this brings us right into the PQC transition critical time frame. Keep that aspect of firmware updatability in mind here because in the embedded space we still find mostly a variety of proprietary secure elements which usually don't offer any firmware update capabilities, let alone certified and proven ones. For long living devices, the ability to update the security root of trust is an absolutely important property. Here is a more architectural view to illustrate the broad range of systems and devices where TPMs are being used. In the early 2000s, the adoption of TPM had first started on PCs, but then and from there strongly grew into much of what today we would describe as cloud or edge computing. Some of the larger systems on the right and in the center even have multiple routes of trust for different purposes, but a TPM is present there on almost all of them and also BIOS and operating systems are well prepared to support TPM. For the MCU class on the left, a TPM has often been considered as too difficult or even impossible to design in and support. Like there is no dominating operating system, um, win Windows or Linux with out-of-the-box support for TPM. Instead, development requires source code and is on bare metal. Or MCUs typically are rather resource constrained in RAM, in code size, in performance. So the host side software stack needs to be very compact and resource efficient. And for any root of trust, it is very important to be manageable throughout its entire life cycle. And like already said, that includes secure firmware updates. So yes, admittedly, TPMs first targeted the larger CPU and APU based systems, but it is long overdue to focus on MCUs and do away with any myths. So WolfSSL and Infineon, we are seriously committed to simplify and enable TPMs for MCUs. In my last slide for today, I'd like to put the focus on a few additional but often overlooked benefits of using a TPM on smaller MCU-based products. Obviously, a TPM is designed to bring security to a high and well-defined and evaluated level of the common criteria EL4, but there is more. Uh, first off, by referring to the common criteria and FIP certification of the TPM, you may simply be able to more easily meet regulatory requirements and make security a more marketable property of your product. Then there is the implementation aspect. Implementing security properly requires a lot of expertise. And instead of taking on everything yourself uh, by using a TPM, you can rely on its evaluated and certified level of implementation and can reduce uh, the firmware complexity on your MCU. That will save you precious development resources and can shorten your time to market of your product. You can more effectively focus on your main product innovation and development and you'll probably even sleep better. If you make or your customers use different architectures, like seen on the slide before, but all of these use the TPM and trusted computing technologies underneath, then any provisioning and management infrastructure becomes instantly more efficient and scalable by reusing the same technology for all products. The next aspect is performance. Small and cryptographically very constrained MCU devices can usually directly benefit from the TPM, which contains, internally contains uh, crypto accelerators, particularly for asymmetric algorithms. Uh, lastly, the last aspect uh, to quickly touch on is that by using a TPM, potentially even pre-provisioned with your keys and certificates in a secure environment that we or our distributors can offer, you can simplify, you can potentially simplify 
your supply chain and logistics and have your device uh, manufactured with less stringent security requirements in the assembly lines, which is often problematic and costly. I am aware that not all of these factors may be equally beneficial and compelling to you, but still you may want to have these in mind when it comes to making security design choices. All right, I'll leave it with this for today and we'll hand it over now to Paul, who will tell us more about how we're simplifying TPMs for MCU-based devices. Thank you for it, your attention. And Paul, please take it away. So thanks, Joseph, for this nice introduction. Here, my name is Paul Kissinger. Thanks for the intro at the beginning of this presentation. Now I will have a look a little bit on TPM, what is nice to know about, and we start with the standardization makes TPM the easiest to use security solution. Regarding, we have a complete standardization from PCB level up to the application level. And this will help us, or you as a customer or implementer, to use a TPM and the, un, uh, on the, and the security on this level. So what we have here, the TPM is a complete standardized. So as I said, we have the pinout and the electrical characteristics is standard, defined by the TCG. You could read everything about it in the client platform. S profile specification. Here we have the same pinout, the same voltages. So maybe if you purchase a TPM from Infineon, you could replace it with a other TPM from Infineon or maybe from one of our competitors. It's the same. We have the on-chip software definition. That's the next layer of that. What is, wh which functionality we have on a TPM? The next step on this slide, we see the wire protocol. Also, this is completely defined. Regarding, we have the same driver for everything. That is pretty uh, nice to know. And if you have a logic analyzer and you know a little bit about the protocol itself, you could read it directly on the lines what has happened there. And also the TPM middleware is standardized. Here we have the TPM software stack implemented in several ways. The most common here, of course, will TPM and some of you will know the TSS2. So, but these middlewares is also completely defined regarding stru common structures and which level of system API, we call it here, maybe the enhanced system API or only a system API. But here, these are available stacks. They are implemented and you could use it. Now let's have a look on the TPM firmware update for MCU-based devices. So the actual status that we have on the update procedures for our customers with, Wolf TPM, with the Wolf TPM stack and an NDA with Infineon, it's already possible to update Infineon TPMs to the latest firmware. So the only thing is an NDA is needed for documentation tools and the update files itself. But if you have this, actually you could update your TPMs also on microcontroller basis. How this will work, we will see it uh, a little bit later on this presentation from David. But what did Infineon for the next steps? Here we are in the middle of the process to simplify the access to our firmware updates for all customers. So here we lower the restrictions for more broadly uh, customers and we will open the option to download and deploy the firmware updates on our Optiga TPMs with the SAV9672 and the 73. And here we will bring it easier, so an easy access that we remove the requirement of NDAs. The only thing that you need in the future will be have a My Infineon account. And then you will get our uh, documentation, the tools and the update files directly from Infineon.com. The motivation why we want to bring these updates to all our customers. What we've seen in the la uh, latest <laughs> years that more and more our customers are smaller. Not the biggest ones, say, create its million of PCs every year, the tiniest one. Here we want to also support with lesser than 10,000 or 5,000, or no more lesser, only 500 uh, devices outside in the field 
They utilize a TPM and then they want to try to update the TPM and needs an NDA with Infineon? Maybe? Really? No. Here we want, this is our motivation, to bring our update procedure to enhance the security, to performance improvements and to bring everything what we have new for our uh, TPMs created that the customer could benefit from. So maintain the security and the protection over the entire life cycle with lower restrictions and maybe less restrictions to get all these informations and files what you needed for the updates on our TPMs. Let's come to the challenges. Why is it not easy to move into easy access for firmware updates? We have to sort out some things for the TPM firmware updates. Also, the first question, what is needed for an open source project to be able to integrate and support the TPM firmware update procedure? Here, keep in mind, some open source projects will say, OK, this is a nice code, but where's the documentation that pr prove that your code will only do this thing that you will promise to us? Here, we need also bring up documentation, live, easy access that everybody could understand what's happened in the update procedure. The second thing, we should bring up code. Of course, if we have up, uh, code that update our TPM, we should provide it. <laughs> and also for that, we have to think about, did we have the right license on all these code snippets? Is everything well prepared that somebody could take it if it's in a good quality that we could share it? And also tools. Do we have tools that you could provide directly to our customers? Maybe who will use these tools, for what these tools are used, maybe also analyzed, but that is not important for us. For us, it's important that our customers have the possibilities to update everything, that also open source projects will adapt everything. And then we have to clarify what we have to sort it out internally for all these things. <laughs> Yeah, and the second point is how we could it make it distribution friendly. What we will provide from site Infineon. Here we uh, explicitly we could say the binary files, of course you need it, <laughs> um, the documentation, how it works, and a little bit of source code for an example. And what Wolf TPM provided this year was a functional implementation and also an example uh, dash a demo that you could see live how this works in a real life environment and actually with our SOB 9670 free. We will see this maybe in <laughs> several minutes. And my last slide here, TPM firmware update for MCU based devices, the next steps. The timeline for the simplified public, ac public access will be. So what we see in the first half of 2024 with TPM integrated firmware update capabilities in their stack. So thanks, David, for, the, for your great work. Also, we have the demonstration of a functional firm, TPM firmware update with a PSOC 6 MCU and with, Wolf TP, with the Wolf TPM stack. What we see, what we will see in the next months, maybe in the first quarter of 2025, the release of the firmware update binary files. Here, of course, you need it for updated uh, TPMs. What we also see is the firmware update tool, Linux only here. And also, and this is the big point, so the most work behind is the documentation for everything. That we will see on myinfinia.com related to the product itself, downloadable on this website with a MyInfinion account. So what is a MyInfinion account? You have to easily register to my Infineon, uh, to with your email address and then you have access. That's all. That is our point, we would say, easy access to our firmware updates. Now I will hand over to uh, back to David. Thanks for listening and have fun with the demo. Thank you, Paul. Now let's talk about Wolf TPM as a product. But first I want to give a brief history. So. The TPM 2.0 standard was developed in 2014, 
and it provides a standardized set of API interfaces, physical hardware, pin compatibility, minimum set of algorithms, and based features. It's very good at protecting private keys. Um, and having it is basically a key store with a cryptographic engine. Most commonly TPMs like historically have been found in Windows um, PCs, servers, um, x86 systems, and it's used for UEFI and, and BitLocker, which is to some of the, the boot processes and um, secure key storage in Windows. It's used for lots of other things. And the trend that we've seen is, is it moving towards embedded as well? Uh, we'll cover that more. So the TPM 2.0 specification, um, as I said, standardizes the hardware and software. There are several chip vendors available, and they're all they all have pin compatible versions. Um, they at least support RSA 2048 bit and ECC 256 bit. Most of them support higher than that, stronger algorithms, and additional algorithms in some cases. Uh, you can do things like measured boot, which is um, you know, providing ev evidence of, of the boot process to your application, and that's done through platform configuration registers, which are basically hashes. It provides secure non-volatile storage. Typically, the chips are in the range of 50 to 200 kilobytes. There's support for encrypting the sensitive data over the bus, um, and there's mechanisms that are required to do firmware updates. There's also standardized endorsement keys and certificates that are generated during TPM manufacturing. And those uh, prove that the TPM is authentic as you can validate the certificate chain. There's also really advanced policy management available. So, at, you know, at Wolf SL, we recognized that there was a demand for TPMs in the embedded project. Even before we developed it in 2018, there was, you know, this, this ask, right? So the customers that were asking were embedded and they were asking for you know, support on bare metal with really small code size. And that's what we did. So we developed it in C. Um, we do not use any external libraries. We avoid using any malloc or free. It's extremely portable and it's supported and maintained by all the original developers, including me. We offer free pre-sale support. So if you had any questions or you're trying it out and you have any issues, you can just email support at wealthssl.com. And of course we're dual licensed. So Wolf TPM supports all of the APIs in the specification, and it provides a stable API for the wrappers to simplify use cases. So when you're trying to use the TPM2 APIs directly, it's cumbersome. The wrappers we developed really simplify things um, to make it easier, and those APIs are guaranteed to be consistent. We also have a built-in transport interface layer, so that allows um, direct communication to the chip without relying on anything else. And that TIS layer is what's used for the spy communication in I2C. We support parameter encryption using AES-CFB, Cypher Feedback Mode, or XOR. Um, authenticated sessions, you know, using HMAC uh, or, or policy sessions. There's support to build without Wolf, WolfCrypt, but it does reduce the functionality. So things like parameter encryption with AES-CFB or the importing external private keys, you know, won't be available. So Wolf TPM is the only stack that's designed for bare metal. <clears throat> and uh, you can look at this Wikipedia page here for a list of other TPM stacks. I think there are ways that you could port those. And I've seen, like even in the Xilinx tools for their FSBL, you know, they have a stripped down TPM support. But we are the only library that's designed for this. And we have lots of different ways to build the library as well. Like configure, CMake, Visual Studio. We do have a, a, a wonderful C Sharp wrapper as well. So common use cases are, you know, a key store, basically um, a vault where you can protect private keys. Those keys could be the ones you use for TLS authentication associated with a certificate. There's um, storage of a password. So you could seal a secret based on a signed policy. And that could be an externally signed policy, um, you know, that includes things like PCRs. You can do major boot, um, the endorsement keys and certificates. Um, attestation, which is if you have TPM-based data, you can prove uh, you can prove that you have um, signed it with that TPM key. So uh, attestation keys can only sign data that's based on the TPM in the TPM. Uh, secure non-volatile storage, one-way counters, cryptographic offloading. These are all great things. And we have raptor, wrappers to simplify all of these. We have TLS examples, um, examples for how to do the certificate validation on endorsement. Um, so the whole certificate chain of endorsement. Uh, generation of certificate signing requests associated with a TPM key. All of it, it's out there. Um, you know, we support SPI and I2C. We also support the Linux built-in driver, the dev 
uh, TPM driver, which has its own TIS. We support Windows TPM base services and all the TPM simulators. So you can really use Wolf TPM across any platform. We designed it so porting is very easy. There's a single how IO callback. So all the inputs and outputs go through the single callback. Um, we have built-in support for the Infineon CI, CY, HAL, SPY, or I2C, and also the Tricore. We have lots of other uh, microcontroller vendors HAL available as well. And then we have built-in Linux SPY and I2C support with the native dev TPM0 and the Windows TBS. So I wanted to outline some of the unique Infineon features. So of course we support all the different modules, but we also support their firmware update uh, mechanism out of the box. So this is the only TPM, Infineon is the only TPM vendor that has done that, that has made public their firmware update process. All vendors do have a way to do this. It's under NDA and it's not very easy to port. Uh, I think other vendors will follow suit eventually. I wanted to also mention Infineon is the only TPM out of all the vendors that does not require TIS wait states. So typically when you send a command to the TPM, there's a header that's four bytes and then there's additional bytes you clock looking for the most significant bit. With Infineon, that is actually not required, which makes the send and receive of the SPI R squared C much easier. Okay, so now let's do the, the live demo for the SLB9673, which is the I2C Infineon TPM module. So this demo was developed for Embedded World in Nuremberg in 2024, and we presented it there at the TCG booth. And it shows how to do um, a firmware update of the TPM module over Wi-Fi. Now at the show, we had some issues because of the Wi-Fi noise, and even here in my office, the Wi-Fi doesn't prove to be very reliable. So I'm going to do a slightly different demo, but I will cover this um, briefly. So it, this source code has been posted to wolftpm-examples and it's out there. You're welcome to try it out and build it. Um, it does require this, this form factor for a TPM, which is not publicly available. Uh, you know, so it doesn't make a great demo platform in my opinion. Um, the the example, if you clone it, you can basically do a make get libs. Uh, you need to update the secure sockets and the WPA3 uh, libraries with ones that I've modified. So this pull request here uh, adds uh, TLS support, Wolf SSL TLS support to the secure so sockets. And the WPA3 one is basically stubbing it out because it's not used. I also found that this deep sleep latency needed to be changed to 125. And you also want to go in and update your Wi-Fi settings, and then you can do a make build and a make program. So when you run the demo, what will happen is you'll get Siri output, and then you also get a web browser page. Um, so really quick, um, you know, this is what the, this is what it looks like. Um, this is the project. This is the readme in here. Uh, if you go to the website, which of course isn't going to open up very nicely for me here. This is the example uh, with the README and the build steps. Um, and when you go to the web page, it'll look like this. And the serial output looks like this. Um, so you can open it up and you can see the status of the TPM and you can choose update, update firmware. Uh, this demo is just not very reliable. I think it has to do with the HTTPS issues. Uh, and I'm not, I don't have time to debug it. It's possible some of the HTTPS issues have been resolved if we update the libraries because it has been a little bit of time. So getting back to what I do want to demo, and that is um, what's available in Wolf TPM and what you see with the Raspberry Pi. So the firmware images are available from Infineon with the myicp.infineon.com. There is a couple things that you need to know. So we'll go over to the readme. So the first thing is, when you get a firmware image file from Infineon, it is a single bin file, and it contains two files. One is a, a manifest, which is the XMSS signature, and then the other is the encrypted firmware. The manifest is about three kilobytes, and the firmware is about 900 and so kilobytes. So the first thing is extracting the firmware from the bin file. So if you make in here, it'll generate a host tool for extracting. When you run the file through, it'll actually tell you the group. Now, the one thing is uh, when you actually run the update command on the TPM, it'll tell you information about the TPM. 
So you can see this is an SLP9673 and it's key group seven. So these key groups have to match. If they don't, the manifest will fail and you can always just reset and go back to your normal firmware. I did notice that it's important in your design to, to wire the microcontroller to the reset pin because during the firmware update process, you do need to be able to reset it. So the next step after you know the key group is to actually extract the two files. Um, this will output a manifest and data file. And then it's just a matter of running the update. Now, Infineon has, I didn't run it correctly, Infineon has actually spent a lot of time to produce a reliable update process. So what's happening here is we hash the manifest, send it down, it doesn't erase, and then it starts sending down chunks at a time. Now, if I interrupt this process, which I'll do because it's fun, it's not fun, it's just, it's great to be able to test this. So it says that the firmware uh, update process has been is in this mode too, which means abandon is not possible. However, I still can recover the firmware. If I run this again, what will happen is it'll run it in another mode. Um, and and you, you do have the ability to abandon, but in this case you don't because the firmware has been erased. Um, of course, I have to reset the firmware. <laughs> I have to reset the TPM again. One sec. Okay, so I'm back. I reset the TPM module. <clears throat> if I run the status again, you can still see the same thing. But now I can actually run the update and it'll continue and finish. You know, so they thought about these edge cases, which is great, um, where you can always recover the TPM. It does not keep the last known version, but if the manifest fails, then it's still there. So all of these tools are all open source. Everything is completely here, um, including the extraction tool, which is really great. And anybody can try it out. Um, so if you have a Raspberry Pi and you have one of the Infineon Raspberry Pi modules, SPY or I2C, you can test this out. There is one other thing I wanted to show, which is how I actually built Wolf TPM in this case. So I used configure, enable Infineon, enable I2C with, with some debug, so I enabled debug. Um, if you build out of the box, it will try to turn on the Infineon tools, but I'm not sure. Um, yeah, I think by default it will work. I can't remember, but if you want to use the I2C, you need to have that option turned on. So you can see at the end, it says that it, the TPM needs rebooted and then it comes back up just fine. Um, and that's really the demo. Yeah, and I'm trying to think if there's anything else. So I think that's it. And now what we'll do is uh, a live Q&A. So um, we'll go back to the slideshow here. So now we'll open it up for questions. Thank you, David, Joseph, and Paul. So right now, I do have one question. Oh, I understand the benefit of a standardized TPM or appropriately secure elements, but isn't a TPM a more expensive component compared to a smaller secure element? Uh, yeah, maybe as the marketing guy here in this round, uh, I take this question. Um, so there's a couple of aspects I think to take into consideration. And certainly in this webinar, I cannot speak in, in absolute uh, terms or, or give you any pricing because eventually as a customer, you're buying uh, the TPM through distributors and by antitrust law, um, they make the pricing, not we. But uh, in the comparison to, uh, to the alternatives of discrete secure elements, um, a few things to keep in mind. One is TPMs are sold in in so high volumes. Uh, I think I mentioned earlier, overall, there's probably more than 100 million pieces uh, a year sold into the global market, not just by Infineon alone, but by all the uh, discrete TPM makers. So you benefit greatly by this high volume mass market security product, which enormously helps to bring down the price. Yes, there may likely still be um, a, a slight price adder uh, above a, a much smaller, functionally much smaller secure element. But in my opinion, the, the functionality, the much, much richer functionality and the fact that everything is certified and has been proven and robust and standardized out there, um, you get a whole lot more from a TPM compared to what typically is offered by this uh, the, the proprietary secure elements. Yes, it may cost a few cents more, but 
especially in smaller projects when as a customer you only buy a couple of thousands or ten thousand pieces the absolute price difference may be relatively little compared to the benefits that you have by using all this ready to use software stack and codes and applications so it's i, I think it's it's really worth to look at this holistically at the cost of ownership and not just make the decision based on on a few cents difference um, of a TPM versus a secure element. I actually did a webinar too uh, that's on YouTube that focuses on the difference between TPMs and secure elements. Mm -hmm. um, you know, secure elements are typically just ECC. Uh, they have a very limited number of keys. Uh, you don't have the ability to update firmware on them. Um, yeah. there's a bunch of other significant differences. They're not standardized. The SDKs between them are completely yeah. different. I mean, lots of reasons, but there is a, a webinar I did. You can look it up, TPMs versus secure elements. Yeah. Highlights that. Thank you. And there's another question. What is the difference between a TPM versus crypto authenticator? I think that's exactly what we were just talking about, if I'm not mistaken, unless I'm mistaken about the term crypto authenticator. Uh, you know, for me, that's just a, a discrete secure element uh, provided by, you know, manufacturer. TPMs are completely standardized. Um, the others are not, so. Yeah, I think what we very often see is an evolution in, in, in customers at the very beginning, very typically, they look for a, a secure key store and probably do, uh, uh, yeah, establish very secure device identities or so. They Things start with, um, with a single or very relatively simple use case. And then naturally you may first look at, at secure elements which just support that. But what we really see over now two decades of TPM that very quickly you go along the learning curve and understand what else can you do with the TPM and want to do with the TPM. And then the, T, the, the benefits of the TPM really start to kick in, to kick in and shine. And that makes all the difference in my opinion that really makes all the difference uh towards the tpm you can do so much with it and for for good reasons it has established itself over over now 20 years as the standard that is generically applicable and populated across so many different architectures perfect thank you and there's another question Good to hear about the other benefits that are not directly related to the security of the TPM itself. But when we need to assess whether or not to add a secure element or TPM, what are the differences in terms of security? Um, yeah, I, I would also offer to take this one. Uh, but Paul, if you want, uh, you can also freely chime in then there. Uh, and, and maybe, David, I think I have one slide in case such a question comes up in the backup slides. Can you pull that up, that one up? I can pull it up. Uh, Shizuka, will you stop sharing so I, oh, I can re replace current share. Yeah, it's coming up on the, uh, this one. Yes, this one. I think the, the, the question goes into a, yeah, often and typically asked question. Uh, I have an MCU and these MCUs sometimes are even ARM PSA level one or two certified. They have their own security properties. Um, where is the threshold? What's the motivation? When should I, I, I uh, what makes on a secure, on the security side, what makes a difference? Uh, I talked about the, the non-security related benefits, but on the security side, um, we take it as granted, but here's a, a few words about it. Um, when we do thread modeling and design the security requirements for our products, both for our MCUs, but also specifically here for our um, embedded security products. Uh, you follow a certain methodology. There are different classes, kinds and classes of attacks. Um, here you find it broken down into logical and in physical attacks, and these break even further down in different attacks. And each of these attacks then um, can be assessed in, in different attack vectors and, and levels of sophistication. But in essence, and I think this the, the, the wedges here at the bottom, the countermeasures in software and the countermeasures in hardware, try to convey the message on the on standard hardware and with the 
the, the security properties that you get there, you can only do so much by implementing the security functionality and using the, the, uh, the hardware capabilities. You can only do so much. But when your device, if your device is exposed to a particularly hostile environment or has a very long life cycle out there, um, you may have different reasons. Sometimes the, the owner of the, the device can even be the attacker. Um, there are many reasons when you, where you may come to the conclusion that the standard security measures uh, available in, of, of the MCU may not be sufficient. And this is where the, the discrete secure element and the TPMs. Um, in, in, in this argumentation, I'm not really differentiating between the secure elements and the TPMs. They are largely designed from a security perspective. They're largely designed to, to augment, to elevate the security that you can add uh, to the system. But again, in, in essence, by adding a TPM or a secu uh, secure element, you make your device, you can make your device um, ready and ready to serve more advanced, more sophisticated attacks and a longer life cycle. Thank you. There is another question. Occasionally, there are reports that one can easily pro prove the bus that connects the TPM with the CPU and inter intercept keys by sniffing on the interface. I think there was an example of that local keys about a year ago or so. Can you comment on this attack vector? Uh, yes, this is actually a very good question, I think. Um... And a little bit historically, in the in the early 2000s, with the first TPM generation, TPM 1.2, at that point, the Trusted Computing Group deliberately took physical attacks on the interface um, deliberately out of scope. But as security um, and and threat vectors are evolving over over the years, um, indeed, this became more um, in scope. And with TPM 2.0, with the TPM 2.0 standard in 2015 already, 2014, 2015, the TPM 2.0 um, started to provide very efficient countermeasures against these type of attacks, um, against sniffing the interface, the I2C or SPI interface. So with every TPM 2.0, you already can make use of uh, establishing authenticated sessions with parameter encryption. Uh, parameter encryption means that in the payload, uh, you can encrypt sensitive, uh, yeah, sensitive data and transfer them securely encrypted between the TPM and the host. It's a bit ironical that uh, these examples, these proof of concepts uh, that you just mentioned, largely revolve around BitLocker because Microsoft really would have the resources and, and the skills to make use of this um, uh, countermeasures that TPM 2.0 offers. They may have their reasons or not um, why they don't, but the TPM would offer this. And then an outlook a little bit to the future because it's sem semi-public at least. Um, in 2022, in the OCP conference, the Open Compute Project, um, Microsoft, Google, Infineon, and Intel, we demoed with a TPM to add an additional protocol layer, an SPDM encryption that will then completely encrypt the entire communication between the CPU or MCU and the TPM. Uh, so no longer just establishing a dedicated session with parameter encryption, but then enable a complete uh, protocol encryption. This from this public OCP demo then went into the TCG. Um, and because it's still TCG confidential there, I will not talk uh, more about it when you will see it coming to TPMs. But... Yeah, I wanted to mention something too. You know, by default, parameter encryption is not on. 
and it's up to the the stack. Like for example, in Wolf TPM, you have to call an API to start a session with parameter encryption. So you call one API to start it, and then another one to actually set it, and it will use it automatically for any commands that have sensitive data in the first parameter, which is where they put the sensitive data. Mm -hmm. um, but a lot of the attacks that have happened have been because people forgot to turn on or didn't, you know, neglected to turn on parameter encryption. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah. Thank you. We don't have any more questions. So thank you, David, Joseph, and Paul for hosting the informative webinar. Thanks everybody for joining today. And I'll email a copy of the webinar recording and the PDF slides. You can keep up with our upcoming event, meet our team in person, read our blog post, and get the latest Wolf SSL and Infineon technology updated by following us on X, connected with us on LinkedIn, and subscribe to our YouTube channel. If you have any questions, don't hesitate to email us at a fax at wolfssl.com. And thank you again. And we, we look forward to seeing you next week on post quantum algorithm in core on November 12th, 20th. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.